who really withstood the ministry of, of Barnabas and Paul. But nevertheless, they shared the gospel. And then after that, it seems that Paul comes on his own and comes into his own because no longer is he called Saul, but he's called Paul. He, he adopts his Roman name and now begins to identify with this ministry that God had given him to be a preacher to the Gentiles. And I like that because as a man who knows his call and he then he really arranges his life around God's call. And that can be hard sometimes. And I know a lot of you have been really desiring God's call in your life, and yet you, you, you kind of categorize God in one little place, and, and you try to live your life and fit God in, and yet Paul and Barnabas did something quite different. They took God's call, and they fit their life around that. So they were found faithful in that. Paul would also be faithful to identify the enemy who our enemy really is, having to deal with that sorcerer. And then Paul was faithful to use his spiritual gifts. Remember, he prophesied regarding the sorcerer guy that he would go blind for his resistance to the gospel, which is really interesting because that's exactly what happened to Paul. Resisting the gospel on the way to Damascus, trying to arrest Christians and quite possibly put them to death in Jerusalem under trial. Paul was knocked off his high horse and he was blinded. But he, he prophesies as God leads him. It's exactly what happens. This guy goes blind. And then Barnabas, we see him. He's faithful to take a back seat. Now, that's a hard one. It's one thing to see, you know, a peer sort of progress beyond you. Maybe you're in the Air Force and one of your buddies has a line number and you were hoping to get, you know. And you're kind of sad, but you're kind of like, ouch, that one hurts a little. And I get that. But in, in Paul and Barnabas' case, Paul was in the church because of Barnabas. The church in Jerusalem, after Paul got saved, it wanted nothing to do with that guy. And yet Barnabas would bring him in and vouch for him. And, and, and really, Barnabas was the reason that, so the, the, God was the reason, but Barnabas was the vehicle that God used to really get Paul going in the ministry. And yet, as Paul came into his own, Barnabas would take a step back. And as you look at the narrative now, it's not Barnabas and Paul, it's Paul and Barnabas. Paul is getting top billing here. Moving on, they leave Cyprus, they head to the Turkish coast, and when they land there, John Mark, their traveling companion, bails on them. He was committed to going all the way and made it halfway, quit, went home. We never really told why, but it was a, a big issue, because later on, Paul and Barnabas get in a big old fight over it. But still, Paul and Barnabas continued on, even though one of the team members left them, even though there'd be more work, even though there was less help. They didn't say, well, one guy's out, let's just call it a day. Not at all, they just continue on. And then landing in Pisidian Antioch, having moved 100 miles on foot north on the Turkish coast, up 3,600 feet in elevation, they get to Pisidian Antioch, they go into the synagogue on the Sabbath, and according to Jewish custom, if there's a high-ranking rabbi, especially from Jerusalem, he's in your synagogue, you gave him the opportunity to be the guest preacher for the night. So the rule of the synagogue gives Paul the opportunity to speak, and Paul faithfully takes advantage of the opportunity. And that's where we stopped last week. Paul took advantage of that opportunity, and then he shared the gospel, masterfully using the Old Testament to demonstrate that Jesus was the Christ, that he was rejected, as the prophet said, and that he was resurrected as well. And so now we pick up. That's the introduction. How are you doing? That, that was just the introduction. All right. Now we pick up at verse 40. Because there's one more faithfulness we see here. And that's Paul's faithfulness to warn of the judgment that comes with rejecting the gospel. Verse 40. Beware therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. See, Paul's just delivered the gospel. He said, it's in Jesus, in this man is justification and forgiveness of sins. And then he says this, he says, beware of what the prophets spoke. Beware that this doesn't happen to you. That is because of unbelief. And now Paul references Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5. 
You see, 600 years prior to this time, Judea and Jerusalem was under siege by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And Jeremiah the prophet is running around and he's warning the people, listen. He says, give up the fight, just go with this. God is disciplining us, just go with the king of Babylon. Don't resist him. Habakkuk is, is prophesying at the same time because Habakkuk and Jeremiah are contemporaries. Sadly, nobody would listen. Jeremiah preached for 40 years. 40 years this man preached, and nobody listened. You think it's tough in Minot, North Dakota? Try Jerusalem at that particular time. Put this in scale. This is 2016, right? Jeremiah preached since 1976. And nobody listened to what he had to say. 40 years. You think 40 years. What's that, you know? Well, I know this. 1976 was a long time ago because I was like nine years old. And it was a long time ago that I was nine years old. Nobody would listen. And ultimately, Nebuchadnezzar did overtake the city. In fact, many Jews starved to death during the siege. The Babylonians killed many, and 4,200 actually were taken captive and brought to Babylon. 4,200. The rest were destroyed. Not because they weren't warned, but because they refused to listen. They refused to, to believe what the prophets said. And as a result, they suffered the judgment. See, God is patient, not willing that any should perish. But if you won't listen to the warning, well, it's not God's fault, is it? And boy, he sent plenty of prophets throughout all their history. And now Paul's in the synagogue and he's preaching. He's giving the gospel and he says, Hey, listen, be careful that what happened to them doesn't happen to you. In other words, believe because if you don't know this, that destruction is going to come. And I'm going to tell you, and it's going to fire me up, and you're going to get all offended. But here's the truth, gang. That was very anticlimactic. <laughs> here's the truth. To be saved, you have to know what you're being saved from. And I'm so tired of listening to people preach the gospel, and nobody wants to talk about hell. It's insane. How can you be saved if you don't know what you're being saved from? See, Paul doesn't hesitate in preaching the gospel to also warn them that there's a judgment coming. That Jesus Christ came to save us, yes, from the judgment of the Father. We have this idea, though, that if we, you know, we say nice things, we'll kind of talk about Jesus, you know, we'll talk about love, and we'll talk about grace, and we'll even talk about atonement, but we won't talk about sin, hell, or damnation, that somehow people will come into the church, and they'll really like us. And because they really like us, they'll want Jesus too. That isn't the gospel. That's not the way that it was delivered. That's not the way it was entrusted to us. We have to face the fact that there is a, an eternal hell. And God doesn't desire any to go. But God will not twist a man's arm and force him to walk into heaven. Everybody has to walk in on their own. You can't push them. You can't drag them. They have to bow their head and walk in on their own. And so Paul stays absolutely faithful. And those who reject the gospel do so at their own peril. And Paul's faithful to warn them about that. The Bible tells us that God demonstrated His love for you and for me, and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. You understand the implications of that? See, it wasn't that God loved me on my best day when I was seven years old and I was in CCD classes in the church that I grew up in, and and I learned the Ten Commandments. That was the first thing I had to learn in CCD class. I had to memorize the Ten Commandments at seven years old. It wasn't then that God loved me. It's not that God loved me when I made my first communion or I had my confirmation or, or whatever sort of religious hoop I had to jump through. God loved me when I was at my worst, when I was an insolent pub crawler in Europe 
That's when God loved me. And he didn't just love me, he demonstrated his love. See, ladies, you've heard your husband say, I love you, right? I hope you have. If not, husbands, uh, see me for a counseling appointment. We need to talk. But it's a very different thing when your husband demonstrates his love for you. That's a totally different thing. See, God didn't just say, I love you. He demonstrated his love for you. And to reject the gospel, then, is to reject his love. As teenagers, many of us had our love spurned, didn't we? But we're talking on an eternal scale here. Imagine this. Imagine a crazy man comes into the church with a gun and he aims it at me. A crazy man named, let's say, Jack, for instance. And he stands up. Right there. And he puts a gun, aims it right towards me. He's got the hammer pulled back. He's ready to go. And Melvin over there, seeing what happens, comes out of here, runs, throws himself in front, takes the bullet, falls to the ground, and looks at me and says, Bill, I did this for you because I love you. Imagine I said to him, so what? I don't care big deal do you think would, would it be accurate in saying then that I despised him would that be accurate if he throws himself in front of the bus in front of Jack excuse me for me and, and, and I reject the whole idea and say you, know, you did it for me yeah but I didn't ask you to I don't need you see ya yeah well that's exactly what happens when somebody rejects God God demonstrated his love and that Christ died for us, but when we won't receive the gift that God has given us in Jesus Christ, well, there's no different than me saying so what to Melvin for doing what he did. Only a whole lot more. We're talking about the sovereign creator of the universe who flung the stars into space and yet knows the very hair on my head or your head or Jack's head for that matter. He knows the very hair. You see, that's his love is so complete for us. And to sit there and reject the gospel is an eternal offense to a loving God. And so Paul delivers the gospel. He explains to them salvation by faith, but he also shares with his listeners the effects of of ignoring or disbelieving the gospel. Now that's not exactly a seeker-sensitive model, is it? Paul was not a seeker-sensitive preacher. He wasn't trying to make friends, he was trying to influence people towards heaven. And so Paul again was faithful. Now verse 42. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. So the, the synagogue worship service is over. The people exited the synagogue. And the Gentiles, that is the God-fearers, that's those who worshipped God, they didn't necessarily proselytize into Judaism because that would involve all kinds of things including circumcision which in the Gentile world that would be a little bit drastic so they come into the synagogue and they they worship alongside read here then that the Gentiles seem to take particular interest in what Paul has to say you see the Jews were leaving the synagogue but the Gentiles actually begged him that he would preach to them the next Sabbath boy I'll tell you there's a, that's something a preacher loves to hear Hey, can you, you know, imagine a guest preacher. Can you preach again here next week? How many of you enjoyed Reuben David that first week he came? How many of you enjoyed him the second week he came? Yeah, it was a great time, man. What a great preacher. Such a joy to have him around here. Well, Paul is asked to preach again the second week. And then, of course, the congregation broke up. Everybody went home. But we read, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. That is, they followed Paul and Barnabas. That is, they became believers. They listened to what Paul had to say. They embraced what he had to say. 
And then Paul and Barnabas do this. They encourage them to continue in grace. Gang, there's a message here tonight. Continue in grace. See, the word continue, it means to remain or to abide. We understand that. That is, these people who had put their faith in Christ were quickly encouraged to remain in God's grace. Now, you have to understand that these are Jews and these are proselytes who've just come into the faith. They have always abided in the law of Moses. The Jews were born into it. The, prof, the proselytes converted to Judaism. So they, they've placed themselves under the law. It was under the law that they lived. Their whole identification was built around the law. And then Paul and Barnabas come on the scene. They preach the gospel. And then they're told to continue in grace. Well, what is grace exactly? Grace is simply God's unearned favor. As we said before, justice is getting what you deserve. You don't want that. Please understand that. Anybody, just say to God sometime, give me what I deserve. God will love you too much to do that, all right? Except at the end of the road, if that's what you really want. And then mercy is not getting what you deserve. But grace is more than that. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. You see, it's God's grace. That's why we live. That's why we move. That's why I was saved and not smoked immediately. Because of God's grace. You have God's favor because you're in Christ. Not because of anything you, not because you're particularly handsome, or have a full head of hair, or a big bank account, or a great education. God doesn't look at any of you any differently whatsoever. God is not a respecter of any social status. He simply loves his kids. So grace is just having his unearned favor. Let's play an exercise here. If you were to work for 40 hours this week and you got a paycheck, what would that be called? A wage. You've earned wages, okay? If you were to compete in some kind of a contest and uh, you received a trophy, then you received a, a prize. That's right, a prize, you see, because of your ability to do better than somebody else. If you worked for your company for 40 years, let's say, and they gave you a gold pocket watch as you were going out the door, then you received an, an achievement. You see, you received an achievement. But when you've done nothing to earn a wage, win a prize, or get an achievement, and you get it anyway, that's called grace. There's nothing that you could do. And that's the truth with you and for me. There's nothing that we've done to earn our eternal salvation. Some of you, but that might just miff you just a little bit or upset you. Let me say that again. There is nothing that you have done to earn your salvation. And by the way, you can't add to it either. If you were to do everything right from now on till the day you die and never sin, you know what? It wouldn't do anything towards your salvation. You have it because of what Jesus Christ has done for you, not because of what we've done for God. Which, by the way, is great news. Because anybody here ever have a bad day? Had seven of them last week alone. All right? But you know what? It didn't change my salvation. I still have God's favor. See, it's not based on my performance. Because I have good days and I have some bad ones. And you do too. Guaranteed. It doesn't change your status in heaven. So anyway, Paul and Barnabas, they exhort the believers to continue in grace. But notice he doesn't exhort them to continue in the law. That is morality. Which, by the way, is a scandalous thought in Judaism. See, morality can't save you. Your goodness doesn't save you. It's only Jesus Christ and what He did for you. He doesn't continue, He doesn't, Paul doesn't exhort these new believers to sort of continue in uh, self-effort or personal performance. You can't save yourself. Does that mean you shouldn't try harder? Does it mean you shouldn't, you know, apply yourself more? Of course not. Life takes effort. Effort is expected. But in the end, you can't save yourself. And Paul doesn't exhort them to remain in some sort of institutional religion. 
Because the church can't save you. If you're here tonight and you think, well, I came to church, good, I can tick that one off, I'm good this week. Sorry. That won't do it for you. Coming to church doesn't somehow maintain your salvation or even earn it. It's in receiving Christ as your Savior, believing what God did for you on that cross in Calvary. That's where salvation is found. It's not an old bondage like the law and like self-effort and institutional kind of religious stuff. It's not an old bondage, but it's a new freedom. It's not dependent on morality or personal performance or any religious hoops to jump through. That is great news, guys. You know, that takes all the pressure off of you. It's just the grace of God. When Billy Graham was young, he was driving through a small southern town. He was stopped by a policeman and charged with speeding. This is a true story. Billy Graham was speeding. You see, everybody can have a bad day sometimes, even Billy Graham. Okay? Graham admitted to, to his guilt, but was told by the officer that he would still have to appear in court. In court, the judge asked him, guilty or not guilty? Graham pleaded guilty. The judge replied, that fine will be $10. So we know it wasn't in California then that he was stopped for speeding. Wow. It could have been North Dakota, obviously, but we're not in the South. But he says, that'll be $10, $1 for every mile an hour you went over the speed limit. And then the judge suddenly, suddenly realized who it was who was standing in front of him. And so the judge pulled out his wallet and paid the fine himself. And then he took Billy Graham out for dinner. Billy Graham says, that is grace. See, mercy was expressed in the fact that the judge paid for him. But then grace came because the judge actually took him out and provided for him as well. Dinner. You see, that's what the Lord did for us. Yeah, he took care of our guilt, absolutely. But you know what? He does more than that. He dotes on you. No one's naked here tonight, praise the Lord. You got your clothes. I'm the only one starving here tonight. I haven't had carbs in 10 days, but... Well, that's not because the Lord hasn't provided them. I'm just not eating them right now. I'm just saying... You know, listen, guys. Continue in grace. Continue in grace. Let your mindset be built around God's grace, His unmerited favor, His doting love upon you, because it never changes. So, why would Paul and Barnabas exhort the new believers to continue in grace? Well, the truth is, for all of us, we have a tendency to gravitate out of the grace and umbrella and sort of into the personal performance thing, don't we? I don't know why it happens, but like sheep, we just tend to go astray a little bit. And so often we start trusting in ourselves. And we think, oh my goodness, I, I, haven't, I haven't done devotions for three days now, or I barely pray, or, you know, I've been saved for 30 years and never read the Bible through and through, and oh my goodness, I'm going to hell. Oh, we don't think that overtly, but that's the attitude that begins to develop in us. It happens all the time. And so Paul, from the very beginning, says to these new believers, he says, hey, continue in grace. Amen. Sadly, that wouldn't be the case, because in not too long a time, Paul will write the epistle to the Galatians, and you see, Pisidian Antioch is in the region of Galatia. And they had fallen out of grace and gone back to the law. And Paul had to write the letter to the Galatians, just to to sort of correct them and bring them back. Well, verse 44, moving right along tonight. We will finish this chapter tonight, though. I guarantee you that. Verse 44. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the Word of God. Wow. I don't know. I didn't do the research to see how big Pisidian Antioch may have been. But it had to be pretty significant. And almost the whole city came together to hear God's word. So news of what happened at the synagogue the previous week has obviously just gone out like fire. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. 
and contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. So throughout that previous week, words gotten around. Now the whole city shows up at the synagogue. Wouldn't that be amazing? You know, a couple of weeks ago we had three dozen people out sharing the gospel door to door. Wouldn't it be amazing if all of, all of Minot showed up at the door of the church? Tell us more. That's what happened here. <laughs> but when the Jews, that is the religious leaders of the synagogue, saw it, they were filled with envy. And contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. I find it interesting. Because if the Jewish leaders sort of disbelieved the gospel or had rejected it, Paul would never have been given a second week to preach. But he was. You see, the opposition here in Antioch came not because of theology, but because of envy. You see, the Jews envied the fact that Paul and Barnabas suddenly had a huge following in the city, and they didn't. It's not to say they didn't have a following of their own. It's not to say they didn't have a, a good-sized congregation. But things were happening. It was surrounding what Paul and Barnabas were preaching and not the things that were typically preached in the synagogue. And as a result, they got envious. And out of their envy then, they began contradicting the things that Paul said. They began blaspheming as that speaking evil against Paul and against Barnabas. It was motivated by envy. That's how ugly envy is. And we've all struggled with it. When I was a little kid, I got a new bicycle. I got myself, well, I didn't get it myself. My parents got me a Schwinn Stingray. Anybody remember the old Stingray? Banana seat, you know, that whole thing. Yeah, sissy bar, you know. Super lame bike today, but you know, back then in, in the, in the mid-70s, that was a cool bike to have. But my neighbor, Dickie Nermy, his father got him a 10-speed, like a little 10-speed thing. You see? And I remember looking at his bike, I'm like, wow. His father was the vice president of a local corporation, you know. Wow, someday, you know, I'm not going to do that. And how quickly envy sets in. Or, you know... You'll know which of your neighbors are envious because you're out there watering your grass and suddenly they come out and they water their grass too. Or you see they've got a new SUV or they've got a big house. Did I tell you i got a new house? Not a new house, it's an old house, but it's a killer house. It's huge. It's far bigger. Right now I think it's a calculated 1,200 square feet per person living in that house. But don't envy me because you've got to see the work it needs. So just saying, okay? But envy's a killer. Cain killed Abel because of? Saul sought to kill David because of? Jezebel had Naboth killed because of? Because her husband Ahab really wanted his vineyard. And Jesus Christ was delivered to Pilate because of? The envy's a killer. Envy is an absolute killer. Proverbs 14 says this, A sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. That amazes me. See, envy is rottenness to the bones. That means if you're struggling with envy, it's not rotting out someone else's bones. It's killing you. Rottenness to the bones. It's a cancer is what's going on. Envy is like a cancer. It takes you apart a piece at a time. It goes to the core of who you are. That's why the proverb says, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it come forth the issues of life. Keep your heart with all diligence. Because that's where the issues really are. The issue isn't with Dickie Nermy's 10-speed bike. Or your neighbor's green grass or their SUV or their 3,500 square feet or whatever. That's not the issue. The issue is your heart. And the problem with envy is this. It always gripes when other people are blessed. That's the truth. Envy gripes when other people are blessed. When someone has something good going on, that's when envy shows up. And the truth is, envy really doesn't think straight at all. 
Envy will have a way of twisting things and warping things and suddenly you become the victim when really you're the one who's doing it to yourself. Verse 46, Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as, as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spread throughout all the region. See, the gospel first went to the Jews. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all that believe, to the Jew first and then to the Greek or the Gentile. God's plan was that the gospel would go to the Jews and the Jews would bring it forth. Judaism at large, however, denied the gospel. And then it went out to the Gentiles and this guy Paul preaching is going to be sort of the primary guy at that particular time to do it. And so Paul, rather than wasting time arguing with those who disbelieve, how many of you have done that before? Well, if I can just win this argument, they'll believe. Doesn't happen that way, I'm sure you've been there. Paul then takes his time and he puts it on those who are prepared to believe, those who are listening. He put his effort towards those who wanted to hear it. And then he quotes Isaiah verse 49, 6, which says this, Indeed, he says, Is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved ones to Israel? I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, what's that mean? What Paul is doing is again, in talking to the Jews, is he's demonstrated to them that the gospel was intended for the Gentiles, not only for the Jews, which was unfortunately the prevailing attitude of the time. And though while the Jews believed that Gentiles could be saved, they believed that they had to become Jews first to do it. But that wasn't the case. And the Gentiles heard this, they were blown away. They were amazed. They, they loved it. Why? Because they didn't have to go through all the, the rituals and all of that kind of stuff. Those were all things that pointed to the Messiah, that foreshadowed the Messiah, that identified the Messiah. But you didn't have to, uh, you know, be circumcised and follow the Mosaic law to be saved. This was amazing news to the Jews, and it was absolutely amazing news to the Gentiles. But Paul demonstrates through Isaiah 49, verse 6, that the gospel was always an intended to go to the Gentiles. And that hearing that, then the gospel took off throughout the region. Verse 50, But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, uh, excuse me, of the chief men of the city. Let me start that over again here. I'm getting too excited. I get a little ahead of myself sometimes. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them from their region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. A little cultural understanding would probably be in order here. You have to understand that in the Roman world, sexual immorality was rampant. It wasn't uncommon for... Uh, Roman men to have a wife and have a mistress. It was a very loose and licentious society. And so, when there were Jewish synagogues in Gentile lands, that was very appealing to women because of the Mosaic Law's strict uh, moral code regarding immorality. And so it wasn't uncommon for high-ranking women in a community to be become part of the synagogue because of what the law taught. And so what's happening here is because the Jewish leadership now is really fed up with Paul and Barnabas, especially where Paul can use their own scriptures against them, rather than try to engage them theologically, they go under the table and they go for the wives of the prominent men of the city. And so what they basically do is they rile the women up so that the riled up women come home to their husbands. 
And when, husbands, you know when your wife comes home upset, you know you're not going to have a very peaceful day, don't you? It's the truth. Men, you can compartmentalize. You can have a bad day at work and still come home and just... And if you can't, you better learn. But your wife doesn't have that ability. She has a bad day at work, then she has a bad day at home. If she has a bad day at work and home, she's going to have a bad day with the kids. And then she's going to remind you of your mother and everything that she said in the past. And, and everything is just going to come up, and uh, here we go. It's pandemonium in the garden. These were very shrewd men that were opposing Paul and Barnabas. But that is the enemy. And men, I can't say this enough. Protect your wives. Pray for your wives. Love your wives. Look after your wives. When they come home and have a bad day, don't tell them they're crazy. That's the absolute worst thing you can do. Sweetheart, you shouldn't feel like that. You're crazy. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Terrible. No, no elbows, by the way. <laughs> Usually his elbows. That guy just got a slap over there. That's <laughs> don't tell him that. Here's the truth. If your wife comes home having a bad day, or if it was a bad night at the church, whatever is going on, say, sweetheart, let me make you a cup of tea. Let's sit down. Let's talk about this. You know, sweetheart, having told me all these incredibly minutia details for the past 45 minutes, I can truly understand why you feel the way you do. Oh, that's big points right there, men. When you say, I can understand why you feel the way you do, okay, you've just paved the road to peace and success in your home. And then you can say... Now, let's just take this one bit at a time and you can kind of start to compartmentalize and, and, and sort this thing out. You didn't know this was going to be marriage class tonight, did you? <laughs> Who would have thought? But I'm telling you the truth, all right? Love your wives because there's an enemy out there and if he can't get to you, he'll go right for your wife. And if he can't get to her, you know where he'll go next? Right for your kids. Right for your teenager. Oh, Yeah. Yeah, that's the most insidious weapon of all. The teenager. A weapon of mass destruction. In the end, yeah, Moab. The mother of all bombs, you know. But that's the enemy. There's a real enemy. There's a real devil. A real Satan who does oppose God's work. And has no Geneva Convention to kind of keep things in check. He just does whatever works for him. And he does a really good job of it. Be that as it may, so effective was the, the plan then of the Jewish leaders that Paul and Barnabas were kicked out of the city. They were kicked out of the county right out of the region. And yet we read here that they were filled with the Holy Spirit and with joy. I don't like rejection. That's why I could never be a salesman. I could never sell anything. I, I just, the, the thought of somebody telling me, nah, no thank you, just hurts me here. Which is terrible quality if you're a pastor or a preacher, you know. I just, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I'm just bearing my soul. Yeah, I don't like rejection. I'm used to it. Don't get me wrong. You know, I've been rejected by girls since I was like 13. But I don't like rejection. I know you don't either. But here's the truth. Though they were rejected and though they were expelled from the region, Paul and Barnabas still had joy. And I'll tell you why. Because the joy of fulfilling the Great Commission far outweighed the rejection of the gospel. That's the truth. When you're doing God's will, and you know you're doing what you should be doing, when you're fulfilling that Great Commission that Jesus gave us, even if people reject you, you know what? There's still joy there. I've still done my job. I'm still doing what my fathers asked me. I will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But if we're focused on numbers, well, somebody rejects it, you begin to take that personally. 
But Paul and Barnabas, they don't take it personally. We just read that they shook the dust off their feet. I like that. When it comes to rejection, they shook it off. You know what it means to shake it off, right? When you come back with a full swing with a framing hammer and you hit your thumb. You ever do that? Just me? That's why I have a framing gun now. I don't have to, you know, but, you know, I've, I've whacked my thumb, you know, and then all of a sudden you go, and you're about to let out an expletive, but instead you go, like this, and you shake it off. Well, Paul and Barnabas shook the dust off their feet. They didn't take it personally. They just continued on their way. That's what Jesus said, right? Mark chapter 6. Jesus said this. Whoever will not receive you nor hear you when you depart from there, shake the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment for the, than for that city. Wow. When people reject you, they reject your message, just shake it off. Don't take it personal, just keep on moving. Take another step. That's what Paul and Barnabas did. Here's the truth. When it comes to rejection, gang, don't take it personally. Even our Lord himself was rejected, wasn't he? Those are really nice footprints to walk in, amen? The story of a farmer who had an old donkey. And the donkey wandering around, fell into an old abandoned well. And the farmer, being an older gentleman, didn't know exactly what to do. There was nobody around. He didn't know how to get this thing out. He couldn't get a harness around it. And because the donkey was long in the tooth, and because the well was dry and abandoned, he said, well, might as well just kill it. What else can I do? But he didn't have the heart to actually shoot the animal, so what he did is he just began shoveling dirt into the well which I think is particularly cruel, but he determined, hey, you know, I'll just bury the thing, you know. I've got to be practical about these things. I'm a farmer after all, you know. So he began shoveling, and of course the donkey began braying like crazy down there, making all kinds of noise, and the donkey realized what was happening. But after a few minutes, the braying stopped. And so the farmer took another shovel full of dirt, and he threw it in the well. And then he looked down, and he saw what was happening. The donkey would... Dirt would hit the donkey in the back and the donkey would shake it off and stomp on it. And Another shovel full, another step up. Another shovel full, another step up until the donkey made his way out of the well. And that's the way it is, and it should be, gang, when people are throwing dirt at you. Just shake it off. Don't take it personally. Shake it off and take another step. Shake it off and take another step. Don't let rejection hold you back from fulfilling God's will in your life. You're going to fail. Can we just assume that? We're all going to fail. All of us are going to be rejected if we share the gospel. So what? I'm still doing the Father's will. You're still doing the Father's will. Shake it off. Take another step. Amen? Amen. I heard this story not so long ago, and I really felt I had to share it with you tonight. There's a story from the last century about a young boy who sat in the coach of a train that was traveling throughout the, through the West. And it was particularly hot. In certain areas of the West, you know, the scenery doesn't change too much. Not much to look at. Humidity was high. People were complaining about the heat, and now they begin to gripe about everything, the food on the train, and the the lack of facilities on the train, the boring scenery, and people who weren't griping were just trying to sleep their way through it. The boy, however, was sort of seemed like he was enjoying the trip, and so an older woman, sort of seeing the contentedness on his face, looked at him and said, Young man, aren't you tired of this heat? The boy replied, Yes, ma'am, I'm a little tired, but I don't mind it much because my daddy is going to meet me when we get to Winnipeg. See, that's the way life should be for you and for me. Sometimes the heat's turned up a little bit high. Sometimes we're a little bit uncomfortable. Sometimes life has its boring seasons. But so what? 
When the train comes home, my dad is going to be there to meet me. And by the way, that's an eternal deal. My 75 years on this, on this earth doesn't really account for a whole lot when I consider the eternity that's beyond. If it's suddenly tonight, in the two hours or so that we'll be here, suddenly get to be 150 degrees in here for just a couple of minutes, would it really be that bad? Don't answer that question. It was completely stupid. I don't even know where I'm going with this. <laughs> Suffice to say this. Listen, in light of eternity, in light of eternity, what's some rejection? What's some pain? What's it really matter in the end? I'm not living for this life. I'm living in this life. I'm living for the next one. Amen? So should we all. So let's have the ushers will bring out the communion. And Father, thank you. Lord, again, for just your word, Lord. We could just mine so much stuff out of here. I thank you, Lord, that we just see faithfulness all over this chapter. And I pray tonight, Lord, that those who have been discouraged as of late would continue in grace. Not continue in guilt or continue in their own abilities, Lord. But they'd be encouraged to continue in your grace, Lord. This amazing fact that you love us and you provide for us and you give us what we don't deserve. And Lord, for those of us who struggle with rejection, help us to shake it off. Lord, may we uh, not take things personally. Help us to continue to move forward. Lord, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. That we would be conformed to the image of your Son. That we would become all that you desire us to be by your hand. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.